Just out of curiosity, why do they call you Madman? Yeah! That's why. Alright, I'm making this video to talk about saving the life of Jorund, son of Sigvald, in a couple of different ways, as well as the lives of all the Jarl's children, depending on the circumstances under which Svanriga becomes king. I will also go over a couple of details about the Cave of Dreams, which, as it turns out, is not the actual Cave of Dreams, and I'll even show you a small and unfortunate detail about Madman Lugos' fortress. First off, let's talk about Jorund. He is the friendly man who introduces you to the Phantom of Eldberg contract, you meet him down in Arinbjorn, which is Madman Lugos' territory, and in fact, Lugos can invite you there himself in case you fight him for Yennefer's honor in Kaer Trolda. And visit me at times, I insist. Jorund's been jabbering about bringing in a witcher for that haunted lighthouse. Do me a favor, meet him for an ale in the tavern near Arinbjorn. Then you but a short jaunt to find me, so as we can knock back something stronger. Sure, I'll knock one back with you, Lugos. Nothing wrong with having a drink in good company. I remind you we've important matters to discuss later. Matters that require a clear mind. To Jarl Madman Lugos and his madness. Normally, based on my playthroughs and what I've read in your comments, players will tend to do the Phantom Contract before resolving the matter of Skellige's crown. And in that case, upon finishing the quest, these two brothers will show up to fight you and they will kill Jorund before the battle is over. I actually kind of like this outcome because there is a piece of quite memorable dialogue as he dies. Pour a nip off for me at times. For Jorund. Son of Sigvald, who lived honorable and died like a fool. However, there are at least two things you can do to avoid his death. The first one is to do this contract after the massacre in Kaer Trolda has taken place. Thank you, Geralt. You're a good sort, ought to be said. Ever consider settling in Kaer Trolda permanent? Like, nah. Now, you might think, based on what I've just said, that the brothers, Cory and Kraki, die during the Berserker attack and so they cannot show up to kill him in the end. But that's not the case. And in fact, the whole logic behind this quest is a little shaky. They do not die, they show up when you begin the quest and are just as rude as if you did it before the massacre. Hey, you! What clan are you from? The reason why they suddenly decide not to kill Jorunt in this case is... Well, they don't have one. On the contrary, they actually have an interest in killing him as well as Geralt, since their father is involved with the piracy around the tower. Jorunt himself implies that the father is up to no good. Cory and Cracky. Only ever troublesome. As is their father, Leif. Eh, interesting in some way. Depends. If it's liars and cards that interest you, then very much so. And we can in fact find proof of that, which sadly we cannot use later. However, in this case, the brothers simply decide not to try and kill us, likely because the murder of Jorund is what ties this contract to the following quest, where you get imprisoned by Madman Lugos, and they say violence is never the answer. And then the quest after that, where he asks you to help his son, Blue Boy, with the Cave of Dreams. And as you know, the Berserker attack introduces a problem with these two quests. On one hand, Madman Lugos is now busy up at Kaer Trolda, and so he won't be able to deal with you. Shut your gob! You're clucking as foolish as a gander hatching eggs! And on the other hand, his son Blue Boy dies during that event. Know who died? Drogadar. Drakeborn Du, Blue Boy Lugos, Yalborn, Otrig. Take some time, mention them all. So, in order to save Jorund, a bunch of people have to die, and you will have to sacrifice a couple of quests. Not to mention that you will not be able to try all the potential ways to get out of Madman Lugos' prison, as well as a certain quest associated to that, which will likely be the topic of my next video. Now, before I go back to Jorund, I'd like to talk about Svanriga as king. You'll see how the two connect in a moment. 
People have said in my comments that they don't really like making Svandraga king because they enjoy the quests where you help Ceres and Yalmar and all that and they prefer not to skip them. Now, in response to these comments, I've often said that in order to have Svandraga on the throne, you don't really need to skip the quests. You can do them both, you can do the feast, you can give Yalmar a shovel, and when the berserkers finally attack, all you need to do is leave the young crates to deal with this whole situation alone. Pretty sure you can handle this fine without me. Aye, we will. It's a bit of a dick move, I suppose, but it ensures that Svanriga becomes king. However, there is actually an upside to skipping Ceres and Yalmar's quests altogether. Specifically, the fact that if you don't help them, they likely cannot make strong enough claims for the crown. You know, no giant's head for Yalmar, no bard songs for Ceres. Fearing neither wounds nor death, she called the Heim from its lair. And apparently Svanriga wins without the need for his mother to cause all the chaos with the berserkers. And so ultimately, the massacre never happens. Now this is not made entirely clear within the game, however there are some subtle yet strong pieces of evidence that this is indeed the case. For this I'll have to thank a viewer of mine by the name of a punk 2013 By the way, wasn't 2013 the year where Cyberpunk was announced? But anyway, he suggested that I should try and search for all the characters who die during the feast in case Svanriga is king and Ceres and Yalmar's quests were never done at all. Which would mean that the massacre never occurred and therefore these characters should be out there alive. Well, what do you know, this is actually true. When time comes to talk to Ermion, right when the Jarls decide to follow Svanriga, the bard Drogodar is alive and well in the main hall. Meanwhile, he was one of the victims of the Berserkers. If you go to Hindersfjall afterwards, to Jarl Donar's home, his grandson is standing right there, alive and well. He also dies during the feast. Same thing on Faro. In um, Harviken, you can find Halbjorn, you know, the young man whose father is crying. A shark grabbed my leg once. Halbjorn! I also made sure to load a save where the massacre did happen and afterwards, towards the end of the game, these people were not there. Now, sadly, I could not find Blue Boy Lugos. I did search for him at his father's castle, in Arinbjorn, in that port next to the castle, whatever its name was, also at the Cave of Dreams, and he's nowhere to be found for some reason. Or maybe I just couldn't spot him. So um, here's a task for everyone who's watching. If you can, find Blue Boy Lugos under these circumstances. I'll be curious to know where he is, if he can be found at all. But we go back to Jorand once again. All this began from our attempt to keep him alive. And here's the thing. The brothers will not kill him if Svanriga is king and if the massacre never took place. The quest is still available at that point and you can do it and have him stay alive. So ultimately, there we have the second way to save him by having Svanriga on the throne and without ever going through the King's Gambit quest or the massacre and therefore without having all of these deaths weighing heavily on us. Well, of course, Ceres and Yalmar will be dead, but there's no way around it if Svanriga is king, so you might as well do it in a way that allows you to save as many lives as possible, including Yorin's. So that's all about the Phantom Contract, but I'm not entirely done talking about Blue Boy Lugos. Get out of my way. Or what? <sighs> These conversations. Or I'll punch your teeth in. Think you scare me? Scare your old son of Odmore? No one elseways is the Wolverine! Hey! Like I said, I did not find him, but I did stumble upon a couple of curious details about the Cave of Dreams. For example, what I realized for the very first time is that the cave is not the actual cave. Instead, it's essentially a small placeholder. The entrance and the first section are the same, but the big, expansive area in which the quest takes place is nowhere to be seen. 
it is actually hidden underground, under the mountains over here to the side of the small cave. Luckily, with the use of console commands and a healthy amount of trial and error, I was able to finally jump inside. And there isn't much going on, just the large cave made up of several themed sections, one for each of the dreams during the quest, but it's a testament to the developers for making these locations exclusively for the side quest, and what's more, hiding them rather cleverly from eager adventurers who might stumble inside too early and potentially spoil themselves by the scenery of uh, Kaer Morhen, for example. And the other curious thing I found is in Lugos's fort, or rather, right behind it. There is a small opening on one of the walls, and it would seem that they use it to throw out people and other trash from there. On the ground below, you know, behind the wall, you can see bottles and a broken cart and a few dead bodies, including a dead rat. Now, initially I was running behind the castle, so I found the actual place before the opening on the wall, and I thought I had accidentally killed it, because you know me, I like spinning around aimlessly and just using the igni left and right, but no, I loaded up another save and the dead rat is still there. In fact, there is a bucket upstairs, a bucket with trash, I guess, that is spilt on the floor, and there's another dead rat next to it. So yeah, um... With that, I, I think I'm done. Okay, never mind, it turns out I'm not done yet. So, I'm recording this a day later to show you another small but interesting detail, and for this one I have to thank a fellow YouTuber by the name of Neon Knight. I'm sure some of you guys have seen his videos, and um, when I was telling him what I plan on talking about in this video, he shared an interesting detail about it. Remember that letter I showed which proves the father's involvement in the whole piracy business? The sender is called Uva. Also, there are a couple of kids who can be found close to the mainland over here, playing with a skeleton. Now, what I never noticed is that the boy's name is actually Uva as well. Hear that? It just said something. I didn't hear nothing. Boo! Ah! Uva, you dummy! How old are you? There ain't no Kekismores here. So, could it be that the two are somehow related? Neon's initial suggestion was that the boy could be Uva's son, and therefore have the same name, and when he said those words, son of Uva, I remembered that there already is a son of Uva in the game. You find his grave while looking for Skull's grave with Ciri. Lasse, son of Niord. Olaf, son of Ova. Inga, daughter of Chortnir. So, could any of these people be related? Or does CDPR simply like calling their Skelligers Uva? Who knows? But I thought it's an interesting detail and definitely worth mentioning. So, thanks again to Neon and to... What was the other person's name from yesterday? A Punk 2013 um, for sharing these details with me and helping me make this video better. Finally, thank you very much for watching. I hope this one was of some help to you and it wasn't too confusing. If so, feel free to give it a like and tell me what you thought of everything I talked about. Special thanks to my supporters and YouTube members and until the next video. Which, like I said, might be about escaping from Lugos' prison in all kinds of different ways or perhaps about committing more sins against Ciri, depending on how my experiments go on that front uh, because I'm trying some stuff but we'll see. So, stay tuned and be good. See you later, Jarlf, son of the Wolverine, or whatever it was. Never chased about me, da! Never!